and we're back. You're listening to the Talking Boxing with Billy C. Show. You're watching us on the Fight Now television channel. Glad you could join us. And if you don't have Fight Now on your sports channel lineup, you need to call your local television provider and tell them that you want Fight Now right now. It's that simple. Pick up the phone and call. And uh, for all the information about the channel, you can find it on their website, www.fightnow.com. Speaking of now, it's time. It's time for another one of those heavyweight spotlights. And on the line right now is my main man, Tony Treem. Good morning, Tony. Good morning, BC. How you doing today, brother? I'm cold, man. Well, oh, please. It's please, cold please. out here in the desert. Please, 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 please. Don't tell me about cold. You know, I, I was talking to somebody from Vegas yesterday, as a matter of fact, and they said, yeah, it's been real chilly. Uh, it, it may get down to around 30 tonight. I said, come on. I, I'd be putting on my shorts and sneakers if it got to be up to 30. I keep my thermostat set for 30, for God's sakes, in New York. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, it's time for another uh, heavyweight spotlight, and uh, you know how quickly these go. I want to read an email to you, Tony. Um, that uh, we received from Alex T. Alex T. is uh, uh, very interactive with the show and uh, one of our longtime listeners. And uh, uh, actually, he's got, he's got a son that's uh, a little better than himself, little Alex, but uh, we'll get to that another time. Alex T. says, uh, you got to do a heavyweight spotlight with Tony on Primo Carnera. He's mentioned once on your show that he thought Carnera was very underrated. That goes against every other source of boxing history reports on Carnera. He says, in fact, the more I read about Carnera, the worse I think he actually was. I'd love to hear Tony's take on it. So, as a result of that, I decided to ask you to uh, do a heavyweight spotlight on former world heavyweight champion Primo Carnera. Why do you think he's underrated, man? Well, we did this show once before, Billy, when you was out here in Vegas, that week he was out here in Vegas. But, but you know... I'd like to tell Alex, you know, if he really feels that he's that Canera's that big of a bum, he needs to get Joe Page's book, The Life and Career of Heavyweight Champion Primo Canera, and and that would enlighten him a little bit more. Uh, but Canera won the heavyweight title in 1933, I believe, against Jack Sharkey. Yeah, in a six-round knockout, and he knocked him out with an uppercut, and. Uh, he and Canary successfully defended his title twice during his reign as heavyweight champion. And and uh, in those two defense in in those two def, those two defenses that he made as the heavyweight champion was more than Max Smelling, Jack Sharkey, Max Bear, James J. Braddock's, all the heavyweight champions between Gene Tony and Joe Lewis acquired combined. You know, and, and nobody gives him credit for that. Uh, yes, he was one-year uh, champion like Canera, uh, like uh, Braddock and Max Bear and Max Smelling were only one-year champions. But they only defended their title one time and lost. Canera defended it twice. On his third title defense, he lost it to Max Bear. And, Billy, uh, i, I got to ask you this because I'm not sure. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm not real familiar with the New York trainers and managers and stuff. But he had a trainer or a manager named Billy Duff, Canera did, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, who was the other guy with him uh, that was involved with Canera that, that was from New York? And they're saying these two were, were uh, mobs, were belong to the mob. And I'm not familiar with their names in, the, in, in being involved with the mob. Are you? <laughs> well, Those two I'm so, not familiar with. Well, well here's, the, here's the correct answer for that. What mob? There's no such thing as a mob, you know. So, um, uh, actually, I don't know, uh, and, and uh, for all kidding aside, uh, I don't know. I know nothing. I know nothing about this, you know. But uh, the truth of the matter is I, I, I am not familiar uh, with his uh, trainers. I, I, I think that, you know, just getting off the trainers for a sec, I, I think that some of the storyline behind Primo Carnera um, and the connections with with um, <clears throat> underworld activities uh, and and the rise to to the top and and some of these fights and stuff, um, I, I think a lot of them uh, were perceived as truth based on the harder they fall, the book and the movie, of course, and and that was you know uh, based uh, on Primo Carnera's life, and uh, um, I, I think that's the illusion that a lot of people get. My question is is. You know, uh, putting the heavyweight championship aside, 
you know, all those other fights that he had, which, you know, were were seventy odd fights. Um, you know, when did he prove, uh, you know, on his rise to the top before he got that shot against Jack Sharkey in, in June of 1933, you know, was he showing that he possessed the boxing skill um, that, you know, you could you could back up by saying that this guy was 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 better than people thought? OK, let's look at it this way. You know, and it's the only way I can really look at it. You know, Primo Canera. Uh, before he came to America, and he opened the gate up for the uh, Italian Americans to, to start fighting in America. He, he's the one that, that because uh, there's all Irish before that. And he, I think he had a. Do you, you have his record in front of you? Yes, because I, do. I don't have it in front yeah, of you. I, you normally I, pull the records. I have his okay. Record. Before he came to America, I think he had 16 fights, and they were, and a lot of people. Uh, were questioning the caliber of fighter he was fighting and were they fixed or were they not fixed and and I for some reason I got I have the feeling you know it would be pretty hard for his managers and trainers or, or people connected with him you know to run all over Europe and in America when he came over here with I think he had 16 and two, he lost by two disqualifications, and he had two, and he had 16 wins when he first came to America. I think that's correct. And it would be kind of hard for his managers and trainers to run all over the countryside to uh, to fix his wife, to fix fights. It wouldn't be feasibly uh, profitable profitable for him because he fought every week, and sometimes uh, just days apart. His first four months. Here in America, he fought 16 times. No, were they great opponents? No. Is Primo Canary a great heavyweight going to go down here? He has one of the best that ever fought? Absolutely not. But he he was better than people say. Ed Sullivan, you remember Ed Sullivan? Ed Sullivan, the the talk show guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ed Sullivan. Okay, he it's a really big the show. Reading magazine. He also wrote for the New York Times as a sports writer. He and Ed Sullivan said that Canera, for a big man, he he moved like a big cat, and that his his uppercut was so diverse diverse how you said so bad that it, it looked like he shot a man out of a cannon out of a cannon when he hit him with it, uh, you know and, and you know he. Canera, he had good footwork, they say. Uh, I, I've seen films of him, and he did move pretty good. He, his, his ability in the ring was not great. They say he had a glass jaw, but he was only knocked out one time that I can remember. He was knocked down several times, but he beat the count. Uh, you know, it, it's... To say that he, all his fights were fixed and he's a bum, I can't say that. He fought some great men. He fought uh, Fritzy Diner, Young Stribling, Chuck Wiggins, K.O. Christner, George Godfrey, Bobcat Wright, uh, Jim Maloney, uh, uh, Jack Sharkey, Keen Levinsky, Larry Gaines, Joe Gross, Art Lanky, Ted Sandwinner, you know, just to name a few. And he killed Ernie Shave. And, you know, in, in, in the ring, in. Uh, Tommy Laughlin, Max Bear, uh, uh, and he fought Joe Lewis, and he fought uh, Leroy Hines. You know, those aren't bums. And, and you've got his record. I'm sure he fought more uh, notable fighters. Yeah, well, I, I think I think I think the issue here with him was all the news that surrounded him during his era. Now, remember, and for all the young listeners out there. Um, and viewers, you know, what, what, what's happened today, and, and we're seeing it on a daily basis on, on the Talk and Boxing with Billy C. Show, of course, um, that, uh, you know, people are valuing video. They want to go to a video, and they want to look, and they make their judgment on that. Now, back in the 30s, and, you know, when he started, I mean, uh, he turned pro in 1928, but he started doing the United States circuit uh, in, in, the, in the early 30s, they didn't really go on TV a lot in the beginning and everything else. They they basically went from town to town, and, and they would go in and, and beat up the local tough guys, and that's how he amassed his record. When you ask, you know, about, uh, you know, being allegations of being fixed and stuff, 
you know, and, and, and you're right. When you say, well, how could somebody have, uh, you know, fixed all of those fights and everything? Well, you know, the thing is, is that the money that's made and, and you know, when, when a successful fix is in or a, a successful uh, I'm going to build up a fighter and, and make money off of it uh, based on, you know, shenanigans, illegal stuff, the way it works it would be to position him uh, for the for the world title and and you know win that title and then bet against him when he steps in and, and fights that real fight you know which uh, would have been uh, the Max Bear fight uh, the people uh, to this day believe that Jack Sharkey took a dive in that fight where he won the title Jack Sharkey to his dying day I, I actually just uh, uh, finished a, uh, a book. Uh, about that whole incident uh, about a year or so ago, swore to his dying day that it was not a, a fixed fight. That he 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 got knocked out, legit. It was it was over. You know, okay. Go ahead. Sharky's uh, Sharky's manager uh, uh, Johnny, I think it's Berkeley, <clears throat> claims that he saw that divesting uppercut that Canero threw, and he swore up and down in the, that night in the ring that uh, Canero had a horseshoe in that glove. And he made the commissioners uh, check Canera's gloves. And uh, Billy Duffy, with nothing to hide, told Canera to leave his gloves on until the uh, commission got over there to uh, check it, to check his gloves. And the only thing they found in that glove was, a, was uh, his fist. Right, right. Well, you know, listen. And, and, but, you know, it's funny you brought that up. That, you know, Sharky did deny till his dying day, that's true, that that fight was not thrown or it was not fixed. But Sharky's wife wasn't sure of that. Well, th that was the big contradiction. She mm -hmm. had went on record saying it was, mm -hmm. but he said no. He said it, it was not. And uh, um, I, I think that that is when the the negativity about Primo Carnera and, and what we see today uh, really started to compound. They they looked at him as, as, the, as the example of, of a fighter being handed cupcakes and and this is the model, you know. You build up your record, then you get a shot at the title. You win the title, and uh, you know you, you you can make some money. Um, you know, and and I can't believe people are so critical of it, especially when you think about it right now, Tony. And and just as those words are coming out of my mouth, you know, you could be smiling and saying to yourself, "Well, isn't that how they do it all today now?" Because they do every single fighter does it we talk about it on a daily basis of how fighters uh, are coddled and hand-fed cupcakes and then all of a sudden they they're wearing a belt at least this guy there was only one heavyweight belt you know it, it's not like you know he was handed a belt and there was some discrepancy of who the heavyweight champion was he was it and and you know in that era you have to give credit for that you bet. And, and Nino Benvenuto, yeah, I'm going to read something. I, I When you asked me to do this, I, I, re, I remember uh, Nino Benvenuto uh, talking about Primo. He he would really like Primo. And he, and he kind of thought that uh, Primo was getting a bum rap. And this is what Nino wrote. And, and if it's okay, I'm going to read it. Of course. Of course. Okay. Hey, uh, I, any guy that still is as great with the ladies as Nino is, uh, you know, come on. <laughs> Okay, Nino Mimonino uh, still tries to change the myth that Canera had little or no boxing ability. They used to say he wasn't skillful. That's false. He had one of the best jabs i ever seen for a boxer of his size. The caliber of men he fought ran the gamut from very good to very bad. But that's true of most boxers and especially so of those whose careers are handled by managers who see the chance of their man as a potential uh, contender. They schedule some easy fights early in a career to help build their fighters' confidence with solid numbers of victories. Uh, Leon sees, and Leon sees is the man I was trying to think of earlier, and Billy Duffy un undoubtedly did that for Primo, but, it's, but it is easily or conventionally forgotten that Canera also fought a high percentage of quality fighters, many of whom were listed in the Ring Magazine annual top 10 heavyweights for periods of time. He was a very busy fighter, entering the ring an average of almost once a month for his entire career, an enormous burden for a heavyweight. Furthermore, when did it become uncommon 
for a promoter or trainer to pad their fighter's record when some with some easier opponents. That's Nino Benvenina. Well, in 1932, he, he, he fought like 24 times. That's twice a month. That was leading up to, to, uh, up to his world title fight in, in 1933. So I, I, I agree with Nino. You know, I mean, um, I, he didn't do anything different than what's the norm today. And, and when you do look at, at him, and, you know, obviously this is uh, being addressed to more than just Alex T. When you look at this guy, and when he did get his shot at Jack Sharkey, uh, re- regardless of uh, uh, you know what people uh, believe or whatever, you know he did have a successful uh, defense, and it wasn't some bogus knockout. It was a it was a fifteen round decision back to back. Paulino uh, Uzeldun and Tommy Lochran uh, both uh, were victims of of Primo Conera in decisions, which you know a knockout punch is one thing. But to go 15 rounds, that you got to display some kind of, of boxing ability, and and let's not forget, at the time he was a monster, six foot five and a half, you know, weighing 260 pounds, you know, tail of the tape. Just just to compare him with uh, with uh, who he ended up losing his title to uh, with Max Bear, he had he had uh, almost 50 pounds on Max Bear. Max Bear barely weighed 210. Uh, but the but the other misconception is how. Uh, many people thought that Primo Cornero was, you know, a foot taller than Max Bear when actually he was only about three inches. That's true. And Max Bear was really concerned about this fight from uh, sources I've read and, and have studied on Max Bear. Uh, he, his training wasn't going real well, and Max Bear went to San Francisco and and hired. Uh, uh, Dolph Thomas, which was a, a well-known trainer and had the Church Street Gym in San Francisco to train him, and Max Bear credits Dolph Thomas for his victory over Max Bear. Even though uh, Bear knocked him down 11 times, Primo got up 11 times. Exactly. And uh, Bear never knocked him out. The referee stopped that fight, and, and Bear won the title on a, on a TKO. But Bear didn't take that fight lightly at all, and if, and if Primo was that easy... And that big of a bum, and as hard as Max Bear hit, uh, uh, why would Max Bear be worried about uh, Primo Canera? Canera is better than Jess Willard, and Jess Willard was a great big fighter. So people say not great. He was an average fighter. But, uh, you know, they, they don't badmouth uh, Jess Willard, you know, the guy that Jack Dempsey beat for their weight championship. And, but... The, but the met but the bad mouth Canera. You know, it don't make sense. Canera was a good businessman. He was a smart man. He, the mob, screwed Max uh, Primo Canera. He went. He was broke. Became a wrestler. Made good money. When he quit wrestling, he was a businessman. He owned restaurants and he and he owned uh, liquor stores. He went back to Italy where he died. He built this big villa which is still there today. His daughters run it, and he, they got a big, beautiful museum of Max Bear with his championship belt and all the all, his whole career in pictures and, and in stories of, of Primo. So you know, I don't think people give Canera a lot of credit when when he should get it. You well, know, was he great? No, no, he wasn't. I mean, he's in, he's only in two Hall of Fames. He's not in the International Boxing Hall of Fame, but Max Bear, Jack Sharkey, Max Smelling. And all the others are in there that held titles the same length of time that he did. He's only in two Hall of Fames, the American Italian and the World Boxing Hall of Fame. But, you know, Billy, I really don't think he's as bad as people say. I just can't believe that. Well, you mentioned Jess Willard. Jess Willard's another guy. When we're talking about when we're talking about heavyweights and size of heavyweights, you know, the two names that always come up is Jess Willard and Primo Conera. And when you look at Jess Willard, as big as he was, you know, obviously, uh, you know, his success in the ring, he was actually an inch or so, so taller than Primo Conera, but he was 30 pounds lighter, um, which gives you the, the idea of how big this man really was and, and that, you know, being that big, he did have some movement and stuff. And, and it's an interesting thing when you uh, look at his record and and you know if you look at it from the time that he uh, he won the world title in 1933 against Jack Sharkey, yes he had the, the two successful title defenses, and then when he fought Max Bear in 1934, uh, he lost. 
But when you look at the next part of his career, his next nine fights, he went eight and one against decent opposition. The only loss that he had in those nine fights was against some guy named Joe Lewis, which, you know, we're talking about Joe Lewis. Now that's as, a bum. Yeah, well, we're talking about Joe Lewis in his prime. You know, I, I mean, I mean, you're talking about Joe Lewis in 1935. You're not, you're not mm -hmm. talking, you know. So he gets knocked out by Joe Lewis. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was not, yeah, I said that the next nine fights, but that wasn't like he had eight of them and then fought Joe Lewis and got knocked out. No, he, he had a couple of wins. Then he fought Joe Lewis and got knocked out and then came back with another five wins, um, until, uh, uh, he lost, uh, three fights in a row, two by knockout, uh, in, uh, in 1936, which he ultimately retired. Then what a lot of people don't realize is he took eight years off before he came back. And when he came back, he fought six more times um, and uh, won three and lost three. And after his last three fights, it was really just raising money for the, for the construction of the villa you talked about. And, uh, you know, if the Italians didn't think he was a great fighter, then why did they just come out with a stamp honoring him, which they did about two years ago? So um, I agree with you. I think that Primo Carnera uh, is a little underrated, um, you know, and, and if you use the same terms that we use today for Primo, and that is he fought everybody that was available to him at the time, then he should get the accolades. And you're right, he's one of the only uh, heavyweight champions of that era when there was only one heavyweight champion. That's not in the Hall of Fame. So obviously people that, that make the difference and cast the votes all must agree with Alex T that, um, you know, he's, he's overrated. Well, you know, it's... If, why did uh, the the New York State Athletic Commission, uh, William, at, I think it's Muldoon, is how you say his name. William, uh, William, Mo, William okay, Muldoon. There was a lot of criti criticism of uh, of Canera after the Ernie uh, Schaaf died. You know, he got killed in the ring after fighting Canera. That he was too big and oversized for the for the small heavyweights that he was fighting. So they wanted to come up with a plan or an idea, you know, to uh, to offset that. You know, if he was if he was as bad as the critics say he was, or or, or people think he was, why was the New York Athletic Commission so concerned of his size and his power of that right uppercut? That's a good point. That's a good point, and. Uh... You know, uh, not to be outdone by the current New York State Athletic Commission, uh, the, New York, <laughs> the, the New York State the New York State Athletic Commission has had some uh, you know skeletons in the closet for years and years. William Mundoon, by the way, uh, in case you guys uh, re hear remember hearing that name, he actually worked with uh, J John L. Sullivan uh, in the past, and he was also a Roman Greco wrestling champion, I believe, is what they called it. Uh, uh, before he became uh, commissioner, he was one of the first guys to get into conditioning programs and stuff. So uh, uh, amazing connections uh, with all these guys. You know, I, I think that when you look at a fighter, Tony, and and you try to determine, you know, were they good, were they not good? I, I think that the same excuses that we use today, um, you know, it's not their fault that, uh, you know, there was only, you know, a handful of good fighters during their era. They beat them all. Well, I think the same has to be said about Primo Carnero, like I just said a couple moments ago. He did fight everybody that was available to him during his era. And, and it, is, it is actually a blueprint that his team put in place to, to move him to, to success uh, similar to what every fighter does today. So I, I think he should be regarded and remembered more uh, historically for the sport of boxing than he gets credit for. He wasn't just a big baby Huey. No, he wasn't. You know, you know, and and I think part of the of the myth, if 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 that's the way I can put it, if that's a good way to put it, maybe you can word it better. But I I think part of the myth of Primo, he was a carnival man before he started fighting, and he was a strong man in in, in a carnival. And, you know, he was laughed at, and, and jokes were made of him and, and stuff. So I think that's part of it. And, and and I'm just trying to, you know, draw conclusions because you wanted to do this show for, for one of our listeners. And, and, and I think that, you know, the listener's so wrong on calling uh, Canera a bum. And if he's just looking at his record, I don't think he understands the record that he's looking at. And he needs to, to really look at 
Canera more open-mindedly. And, you know, the listeners think you and I put the Cliscos and, and, uh, and Lewis down, uh, Lennox Lewis down. And we not. We are not. You know, they fought. They're fighting in today and kind of like Canera fought in his day. The, Canera fought everybody. The Cliscos and, and, and Lewis are fighting everybody. And you can't take any, nothing away from them. And I respect those guys as heavyweight champions, but the the opposition is so poor that it doesn't give them the true credit that they deserve. And now you go back in time, you look at a heavyweight who fought everybody. The opposition was not as great. A lot of his opponents were not great, maybe I should say, but it's the same story. Yeah, that's the key, and I think you hit it on the head. You know, um, he's doing the same thing as a Klitschko or a Lennox Lewis. Now, now, mm-hmm. granted, we got to give Lennox Lewis and and the Klitschkos credit for being able to uh, become proficient in fighting the smaller guy and and utilizing their their jab, which reach and and height advantage, maybe uh, absolutely a little better than Carnera did. But 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 this the science of boxing has evolved a little more too. So. You got to keep that in in mind. One thing I do want to stick up for Alex T about he wasn't necessarily calling uh, Primo Carnera a bum, Tony. What he was asking was, "Tell me why you don't think he's a bum?" You know, because everything that he reads uh, and and everyone's uh, opinion of Carnera was in fact that that he was a bum. But but I think that the most important thing that we can say about Primo Carnera, um, other than going back in time and witnessing it uh, live is that he fought everybody that was put in front of him. His his road to a championship was no different than today's. They It was a matter of fact, it, it seems to have been the blueprint uh, for it, uh, for today. And he continued with his career uh, after losing the world title and was, for the most part, pretty successful, except for some guy named Joe Lewis, you know. so um, and, and then Joe Lewis's reign, uh, you know, the heavyweight division was, was um, you know, a little better. I find it interesting that, you brought up, and that's something I, I never knew, uh, that the New York State Athletic Commission um, was ready to try to incorporate some rules because they felt this guy was too big, which was an advantage uh, over other heavyweights of the time. And, and I find that fascinating because today it's the complete opposite. They want to have another division because... Uh, you know, uh, they feel that, that, that the guys are, are, are too big for these uh, opponents as well, you know. So, I mean, it's uh, uh, what goes around comes around, it looks like. Well, Mald- Maldon thought he had, you know, Clary uh, fought well in the, in the clinches, and, and he could wear his opponents down because of his size. You know, he was so much bigger. He outweighed them. And I'm going uh, to allude to what you said earlier. Uh, you know, he outweighed them 60 to 80 pounds when he got in the ring with them. And, and Muldoon thought that that was an unfair advantage for Canera. And, and so he wanted to do something different. And, I, and that was interesting, I thought, also. But uh, it never came about, uh, to my knowledge, or, or any of the sources I've been able to read or anything. I don't think Muldoon ever got that accomplished. But uh, it, he, did, he was really concerned of, over his size and how big and, and strong he was. And his muscle, he was so muscular, and he was always in, Canera was always in great shape, always. And he was so muscular. And his muscles, you know, a lot of people think, you know, you have muscles, you can hit so hard. Well, muscles don't make you hit hard. No. You don't make you hit any harder, you know. Uh, that it just, you know, but it will slow you down. And, and Canera was kind of slow because of his muscular stature. And so he didn't, he wasn't as fast with his hands as he could have been. And... I think that was a concern of Muldoon's also because of because he'd get you and hold you and, and he'd you know he'd put his weight on you and, and it, it would hurt his opponents you know it, it, it would make them tired it would and it, that's how you win fights they still do that today right they lean on a, a, a bigger guy will lean on his opponent and try and tire him out and and I think I think that you know assuming that there was no you know underhand or or corruption behind that I think that the fact that William Muldoon who was the uh, New York State Athletic Commissioner at the time, uh, because he was even looking to 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 change rules uh, for these bigger men uh, of the time. I, I think that speaks volumes about what they thought of Primo Carnera. I I honestly believe a lot of the the the, the perception of Primo Carnera came after 
his career was over and primarily when harder they fall when the book came out and then ultimately the movie because that really showed you uh they depict him as being a, a talentless you know no nothing and uh you know all uh, all fixed and and i don't believe that that was uh uh all the case but uh uh hey listen like i said this was a guy and and in the in, in a nutshell here as we wrap it up the, this is a guy who fought everybody that was available during his era um you know fought and won continued on his career he amassed 88 wins for his uh career 71 by knockout uh, 532 rounds as a pro with a 69% knockout ratio, which is pretty damn good. He did have 14 losses, was only stopped five times. Uh, three of those were, were towards the end of his career. Uh, Tony mentioned uh, the one early on in his career. Uh, you know, I, listen, six foot five and a half, 85 inch reach. The guy had, uh, uh, he weighed about 260 pounds when he fought. Sounds very familiar to me. Uh, almost sounds like a Lennox Lewis or a Vlad Klitschko. And Tony made a great point earlier uh, about, you know, these guys doing the same thing he did, you know, and everybody regards them as great today. And uh, they regard uh, Primo Carnera as uh, uh, as a bum that was just hand fed uh, uh, fixed fights, which, uh, you know, hey, it's it's long over with now. All I know is as a nation. Italy, you know, how would you, why would you want to stamp on a guy if it was a foregone conclusion that, that, you know, he didn't achieve what you thought he achieved on the up and up? So I, I, I have a tendency to, to agree with Tony. I think that Primo Conera, um, you know, was he a great fighter just like Tony said? No. Was he the best ever? No. But I think that in comparison to, uh, some fighters of today and, and you know, even fighters that uh, have come along the way uh, for the last uh, 50, 60 years or so. I, I think this guy deserves more credit than he's getting, Tony. Oh, absolutely. And and one thing you mentioned about the movie, the bigger are, the bigger they are, the harder they fall, uh, w- was a movie about Primo Canera. That's true. But, uh, and, but I think this is an interesting point, and I hope the listeners uh, agree. Uh, Primo sued the the, uh, the movie company for that for misportraying him in in the movie, and the judge uh, denied Primo the win because uh, they said they had a right to tell a story, and they were just telling a story. It may have alluded to you, Primo, but it was just a story. It was a Hollywood story. So uh, all that stuff in that movie that people watch it and and draw the con- conclusion on Primo. Ought to do a little uh, research and find out that that was just a movie and it wasn't it wasn't com- completely true. Yeah, he was connected with the underworld. Yeah, he was uh, broke a- as a heavyweight champ and they broke him. And I think that he was paid after the Sharky fight thirty seven dollars and sixty cents because he stole all his money. But that movie was just a movie. And, and it wasn't all true. It was just based on a man that was, that gets little credit, and they wanted to make some money off of him. You know, I, I mean, we're way over our time now. But, you know, it's funny how fighters and, and, and people perceive management and promoters from, from stealing money from them. Because, you know, and, and this is a message to all the young fighters out there. You know, if you sign a deal with a promoter or a manager... And, you know, they start giving you, you know, some cash. Hey, you need some spending money. You need a car. You need an apartment. You need this stuff. You know, it's easy to assume that they're giving it to you out of the goodness of their heart because you're going to, you know, be a great fighter. But the truth of the matter is, is it's a loan. And as soon as you make money, they want their money back. And that's what happened to Primo Carnera. All of those bus trips and the and the town to town to town and, and the meals and, and all of the things that, that took place – they kept records of, and when he finally had that money, uh, you know, they wanted their money back, and and they do the same thing today. Ask Chris Ariola, ask all these fighters that you know uh, got their fast uh, 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 roads to the title, and uh, you know why they continue and and all this stuff. Uh, it, it's the same way. Nothing's changed. Nothing's ask changed. Ask the people that fought for Don King. Well, you know, and Don King, you know, that's a whole nother issue. You know, everybody always assumes that Don King always screwed everybody. I'm sure he has, and I'm sure every uh, promoter on every le- level uh, has one way, shape, or another. But there's also the fighters sometimes are to blame, you know, not I only. No, that's not what I'm saying, Billy. What I mean by ask Don King, Don King made loans and gave money out and stuff. 
And after the fight, he wanted his money back. That's the point I was trying of to make. Course. I'm not saying he was screwing the fighter. No, no, of course. And and there's been more people that have uh, beat Don King out of money than Don King has beaten out of money. And that I know for a fact because uh, uh, I, I've seen some of the numbers. But, um, you know, uh, one other thing. It's interesting that you, you brought up the, the movie and that uh, uh, Primo Carnera tried to sue. You know, the same exact thing happened 50 years later. When Rocky came out, and Sylvester Stallone uh, did the story of Rocky, uh, the Chuck rest, Webner. Chuck Webner, that's correct, yes, sir. And that's not only Chuck Webner's story; even some of the sequels were Chuck Webner. Now, Chuck Webner tried to sue Sylvester Stallone uh, as well, and um, it never reached the courts. They did a settlement outside of court. Uh, it just recently went through, and I say recently, over the last you know eight to ten years. And uh, Chuck Webner did get a chunk of money. Uh, if he would just drop it. And uh, uh, apparently uh, that's exactly what happened. So I guess the laws have changed a little bit. And if you uh, blatantly uh, steal somebody's life that Chuck Webner was able to prove, uh, look at my clippings, look at this, look at that. Uh, he did. Uh, he must have had enough of a case uh, to have Sylvester uh, Stallone throw him uh, uh, some money. And, I, and from what I understand, it was at least a million. So, um, hey, you know, what goes around comes around, right? And when are we going to get our check? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, but, but, but from what I understand, we, we may have a law. We may have a, a case coming soon, you know? So, uh, you know, with all these copycats out there, Tony, you know, you never Here know. You, go. you never know. Anyway, never Primo know. Carnera, heavyweight spotlight. Uh, you know, I think the bottom line with this guy is uh, was he a superstar? Was he, was he one of the greatest ever to, to lace on a pair of gloves? Uh, I think both Tony and I agree no. But he also wasn't the worst. And I think the best thing uh, that was said on, on today's uh, uh, episode here is what Tony said. He's doing the same exact thing as these guys are today. He's fighting everybody that's available to him. And why do we make these uh, you know, uh, consolations or excuses for the fighters today where you can only judge them on who they fought, who was available, when Primo Carnera did the same exact thing? And uh, I think that's the way we should end it, Tony. Uh, let's end her. <laughs> well, no, I'm just saying. I mean, I mean, in a nutshell, that's it. So, uh, but anyway, hey, hope you enjoyed this episode of uh, the Heavyweight Spotlight. I certainly have, and I look forward to the next one. If you have any suggestions or you want to learn uh, a little more about uh, a heavyweight in specifics, uh, specifically a heavyweight that uh, you want to know, drop me an email, Billy at Talking Boxing, T A L K I N B O X I N G dot com, and I'll try and pull some strings with uh, the man himself, Tony Treem and see if we can uh, get her done. Any final thoughts? Billy, it was a great show, I think. I, I hope that uh, Alex uh, had answered some of his questions, and uh, it, it uh, satisfies his need to learn about the, the greats of the past, and uh, hopefully we did our job today. Well, hopefully uh, everybody enjoyed it, and until next time, we'll see you later. Ciao, baby. Ciao, baby. <laughs>